everybody seems excited about this new, safer center plane brake but you, Dan. Well, I don't see why they had to go and change the brakes in the first place. Our brakes always were the safest and best in the business. You've got a good point, Dan, but you can't stay ahead of the pack by resting on the oars. We've applied the forward look to safety, too, by developing this new brake. Well, Gus is right, Dan. Cars are heavier today, they've got more horsepower, and they all travel faster. To control the increased weight, power, and speed, you just have to have safer braking. Now we not only have a more effective brake, but this center plane design is a lot easier to adjust and service. Did I hear you right, Tech? Is it really going to be easier to work on? Yes, Dan, you heard right. This new brake works very simply, and since there are no complicated parts involved, service and adjustment are going to be a breeze. Well, in that case, tell me more. Let's have the whole story. Okay, Dan. This new brake is bound to be a popular feature on our new Imperial, Chrysler, and DeSoto models. Owners are going to like the increased lining mileage this design provides. Besides that, the brakes are easier to apply. There's less pedal effort required. You can make more successive high-speed stops, each one a positive braking action. Safety with a capital S. What's more, Dan, this new brake reacts faster than ever. You get good braking in a hurry. Another big safety feature. Well, I can see why you fellows are steamed up. But suppose you tell me exactly what's new about this brake. Okay, Dan. This new brake introduces two important improvements. First, there's a new center plane construction. And second, the anchor bolts have been eliminated. Since there are no anchor bolts passing through the brake shoe webs, brake shoes are of a floating type. Anchors are used at the heel ends, but they serve more like a pivot point and ramp for the shoe than the former anchor did. Another thing, the brake shoes have been redesigned and are a half inch wider. This means a 25% increase in lining area. But you'll notice we're still using the same type of brake drum design, cycle bond brake lining, and the same wheel cylinder arrangement. Yeah, two wheel cylinders on each front brake. Sure, Dan. After all, 60% of the braking is done at the front wheels. At each rear brake, there's a double acting cylinder to provide the 40% braking that's done at the rear wheels. So, you'll find quite a few things familiar, Dan. That's what makes it an easy brake to work on. The main differences are in how the brake shoes, guides, and anchors are constructed. In addition, there's a difference in the action of the brake shoe when it's being applied. Well, okay. But why is it being called a center plane brake? Center plane just means that the wheel cylinders and brake shoe return springs are mounted right in line with the center plane of the shoe. In other words, the forces that apply and release the shoe all work in a single plane. Two steel support plates guide the shoe in this same plane. You can see then, Dan, everything works together in one plane and keeps that brake shoe from cocking. Yeah, Tag, that's pretty clear. It's a kind of no-tilt action shoe. Correct, Dan. And the key to the whole works is the new support plate assembly. There's an inner and an outer support plate, separated by spacer sleeves. The brake shoe anchors, adjusting cams, and return spring links are also attached to the support plate setup. The sleeves, cams, and anchors team up to keep equal spacing at all points between the inner and outer support plates. This spacing is about 1 32nd inch wider than the thickness of the brake shoe web. The plates support the web of the shoe at the toe, center, and heel. This keeps the shoe from tilting, so the surface of the lining always contacts the surface of the brake drum evenly over its entire width. The way the wheel cylinders are mounted also provides an even application of the brake shoe. Just how are the cylinders mounted, Gus? Well, they're mounted to the support plate assembly. On the front brake, Part of each support plate extends against the back of the cylinder to form a rigid mounting for the cylinder. This improved center plane mounting puts the push rod directly in line with the shoe web. That means the push rod pushes the brake shoe out in a straight line. Now tell him about the return spring too, Gus. Oh yeah, 
That ties in with the movement of the shoe. You'll notice, Tam, the return spring is hooked to the web of the shoe and to a link located between the support plates. So, when the spring pulls the shoe back to release position, it pulls it straight back. Oh, I get it. The shoe travels out and back in a straight line with no possibility of wobbling. That's right. Now, uh, there's something else I want to explain. Notice that the anchor doesn't go through the web of the shoe. The anchor, instead, is riveted between the support plates. The heel edge of the web just rests against it. Now, what's more, notice that the web at the heel end is cam-shaped, where it rests against the anchor to control the way it pivots and slides during brake application. Bear that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind, Dan, is that the shoe is floating. It's not rigidly fastened at either end to the support plates. Right, Tech. Now, here's how the new brake works. When the wheel cylinder push rod pushes the toe end of the shoe out against the rotating drum, the drum tends to carry the shoe with it. Since the shoe is free to move slightly, the cam-shaped heel end of the shoe pivots at the anchor. Instantly, then, the heel end of the shoe is forced out against the drum. Actually, this movement happens faster than it takes to tell it. The heel and toe ends of the shoe go out against the drum at practically the same instant. And as soon as the lining contacts the drum, controlled, self-energizing action begins and draws the shoe into even tighter contact. Wait a minute. Self-energizing what? By self-energizing action, Gus means the shoe and drum do part of the braking job themselves. Contact friction plus the turning drum form a great attraction for the shoe. It's like holding a chisel on a grinding wheel. If you hold a chisel loosely, the wheel tries to take it out of your hand. Oh, I think I understand it now. The drum tries to carry the shoe with it. That's right. As a result, the rotating force of the drum helps apply the brake because it forces the shoe tighter against the drum. And yet the brake can't grab because the cam shape at the heel end controls the shoe movement. It won't let the shoe wedge itself between the drum and anchor. That's the story in a nutshell. And that's why this brake gives good stopping power at the wheels with only a light pedal pressure. That it does, Tech. And this design controls the self-energizing action so you get all its braking benefits with none of the harsh action possible when the self-energizing action is not controlled. Yeah, sure looks like a nice brake. But I'm not going to get too excited about it until I get a little experience with it. Experience? Like what, Dan? Like how easy it is to service, of course. That's what I'm interested in. Ah, uh, well, that's where you learn to love this brake, my boy. Just turn the record and you'll hear the glad news. As Gus can tell you, Dan, this new brake requires only a minor adjustment. You don't have to worry about a major adjustment, shifting anchors and measuring clearances at the toe and heel ends. Sounds great. How is that minor adjustment made? Why, you just turn the adjusting cam to move the brake shoe out against the drum as we always have. The cam in this design bears against a lug on the brake shoe web. Turning the cam controls clearance between the lining and drum, controls the amount of brake pedal travel, and corrects for wear on the lining. Adjusting the front brakes, Dan, is different from any previous procedure. Turn each adjusting cam in the direction of forward wheel rotation. Remember now, in the direction of forward rotation. That means you'll push up on the hand end of the wrench when adjusting the rear shoe of the front brake. Turn each shoe against the drum until it locks the wheel. Then turn the adjusting cam slowly in the opposite direction until there is no drag. I see. Now, how about the rear brakes? Well, on rear brakes, the procedure is the same as we've been using. Turn the forward shoe adjusting cam in the direction of forward wheel rotation. Turn the reverse shoe adjusting cam in the direction of reverse wheel rotation. I see. Adjustment sure is easy. Wait a second. After making the adjustment, hit the brake pedal a couple of times. Then make sure all wheels are free. Tech's right. That's always a good check to make. Now, if the brakes have been relined, 
or if new shoe assemblies have been installed, apply the brake pedal prior to adjusting the shoes. This causes the shoes to center themselves in the drum and makes adjustment easier. Yep, it's fairly clear cut. Removal of the brake shoe whenever required is also easy. Block the brake pedal so nobody will accidentally hit the pedal while the drums are off. After that, back off the adjusting cams to provide clearance between the drum and the linings. Then, remove the wheel, hub, and drum assembly. Use this tool to remove the return springs. Insert the tool in the return spring link so the slot in the tool cam engages the spring hook. Turn the handle to disengage the spring. Then, turn the handle in the opposite direction to release the spring. Once you try removing or installing that return spring without the proper tool, you'll sure find out how necessary the tool is for the job. Looks like a strong spring, all right. I'll be sure to use that tool. Fine. Now, remove the two spring guide retainers and guides next. Just push the retainer in and give it a quarter turn to release it. That lip on the guide, incidentally, is for correct positioning on the outer support plate. Finally, slide the shoes away from the support plate assembly. Okay, Gus. Now, if we ever replace the shoe assembly or reline these new brakes, what about grinding? Well, the service shoes we get from our parts wholesaler are already ground 10 to 24 thousandths under drum diameter. If we did our own relining, we'd have to take care of this grinding. Incidentally, Dan, those linings always have to be ground before they're installed on the car. You can't grind them on the car. It just won't work. I see that, Tech, and I'll watch it. Attaboy, Dan. Now, before installing the shoes, apply a thin layer of lubricant to the web where it contacts the support plates, cams, and anchors. Then, install the shoes and drums and adjust the brakes. Okay, Gus. Clear it up. Now don't forget, Dan, any time you replace linings or brake shoes, always use approved lining and shoe assemblies. They're engineered especially for this new brake. That's good advice, Tech. In addition, the same material should be used when relining the front or rear brakes. And when relining the front brakes, be sure to reline both fronts, not just one. You can count on it, Gus. I'll keep those points in mind. As long as we're on the subject of brakes, I'd like some information on how to handle a brake squeal on past model brakes. Sure thing, Dan. But you know, of course, that it pays to road test a car when an owner reports a brake squeal. Oh, I road test them all right. But locating the squeal isn't always easy. Yeah, you're right, Dan. It pays to take someone else along. Have your helper stand on the curb and listen for the squeal as you stop alongside. He'll be better able to tell you if the front or rear brakes are sounding off. A brake drum damper spring on each rear wheel will often eliminate squeal at that point. Be sure all damper springs have the proper tension. Also, install the full spring alone, not the band and spring. But suppose the springs don't eliminate the squeal. Well, in that case, you'd pull the wheel and check the drum. If it has a black or gray binder type of deposit glazed on the surface, sand it off lightly with emery cloth or fine sandpaper. Before you do that, however, stuff a clean rag into the wheel bearings so none of the emery dust or sandpaper grit gets in to score the bearings. That I'll do. But suppose the drum's okay. What then? What then? Why, well, you check the worn areas of the lining. If the lining wear pattern is uneven, you can easily tell what's wrong. Ouch. You know, I really knew that. But I could stand some brushing up on wear patterns. Well, Dan, uh, excessive wear at the toe means high pressure there because of incorrect brake shoe adjustment. In a case like this, there's generally not enough clearance at the toe and too much at the heel. So there's only partial contact between the lining and the drum. That leaves the rest of the shoe free to vibrate and sound off. Excessive wear on one edge of the lining means the adjusting cam pin's too high or too low. Oh, I remember that now. Wear on the inside edge means an adjusting cam pin too high, tilting the shoe outward. A pin too low tilts the shoe inward and wears the outside edge. Both conditions can cause squeal. 
That's the idea. Diagonal or spotty wear points to a shoe out of line with the drum. The shoe might be bent or twisted, or the brake support could be sprung, resulting in an incorrect cam pin height. There's a new tool for raising the height of a cam pin that's too low, Dan. Gus can give you that story. Oh, yeah. That's this cam pin height adjusting tool. You put it over the pin and tighten it with a C-clamp. This bends the brake support at the pin and moves the pin out. Do this gradually and check pin height frequently so you don't get it too high. On front wheel brakes, remember, the pin or the rubber plug in the end of the pin should be as high as the flat surface on the mounting lug behind the cylinder. On rear brakes, the pin should be as high as the flat spacer under the anchor bolt. Oh, that comes back to me now. I measure the height with this special gauge. If the pin is too long, I just file enough off the end to get the proper height, eh? That's right, Dan. And remember, you can't grind the lining of a misaligned shoe, nor can you straighten a twisted shoe. Always replace the shoe instead. Replace the brake support, too, if it's sprung. All right. And I'll use genuine parts. You be sure you do, Dan. Now, here's how to check a shoe for twist. Support the anchor end of the web on a surface plate and hold the web flat with the plate. Swing the toe end up to the surface plate. If the shoe is bent, the web will either strike the plate or ride above it. Okay, and if that's what I find, off with the old and on with the new shoes, right? That's the answer, Dan. Always check a new shoe assembly to see if it needs grinding. If it does, remember that on past model brakes, the lining should be cam ground 20 to 40 thousandths under drum diameter. I see. 20 to 40 on past model linings. Right, Dan. Now, have we been of any help on brakes? You and Gus sure have, Tech. I certainly feel at home on these and on the new center plane brake. Well, that's fine. This reference book, by the way, has even more information on both types of brakes that you'll find helpful. Swell, Tech. I'll be sure to look it over. And a boy, when you and all our master technicians stay on top of brake service, our owners will keep counting on us for miles of safe and trouble-free driving. Thank you.